Welcome back to another Courageous Man, Foolish Man. Peter, walking on water. If you'll turn to Matthew 14, 22 and we'll get started. Right. Remember, these be, uh, Courageous Man, Foolish Man, I'm here to encourage the brothers in Christ, the sisters in Christ, to be courageous and to be careful that, to try not to be foolish, but when you are, to turn it around, go back to the Lord, and be courageous again. Don't let the times that we become foolish and, and trip and fall, that, oh, we're done, you know, to be courageous. So Matthew 14, chap chapter 14, verse 22. Birds are out this morning. And straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and to go before him unto the other side, while he sent the multitudes away. So he put his disciples in a ship and said, you go ahead and row to the other side and I'll meet you there. Verse 23, And when he had sent the multitude away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. Okay. One thing I always keep trying to say is I'm a King James Bible believer. So we use in the King James Bible. It's God's perfect written word in English. So the setting is Jesus sent them in a boat across the water to the other side and he sends the people away and then he went up into the mountain apart to pray and when the evening was come he was alone. Now part of my God's ministry through me is to push and push and push the brothers and sisters in Christ out there to pray for each other. Pray for yourselves. Always take everything to the Lord in prayer. Uh, the song, uh, What a Friend We Have in Jesus, take it to the Lord in prayer. He wants to hear about anything and everything from you. Your struggles, your wants, your needs, the joys. He likes you. To, he wants you to give him thanks in all things. And I'm skipping ahead. But uh, Luke 9.18, And it came to pass, as he was alone praying, his disciples were with him. And he asked them, saying, Whom say the people that I am? So he's with the disciples, yet he's praying alone. I'm just throwing some numbers out there, like 90% or more, a majority, the vast majority of your prayer life is going to be one-on-one -on -one with the Lord. When you're in public, I'm on the beach, I'm talking with the Lord, I'm praying, I'm walking, I'm memorizing scripture, I'm looking and collecting agates, uh, sea glass, those are my two biggest ones. And there's other people around it. But I'm still praying to the Lord alone, one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, when you're around people and you're praying, you're still one-on-one -on -one with the Lord. Jesus did it. Uh, there's a lot of times Jesus went off to be by himself, specifically nobody around, and pray with the Lord one-on-one. -on -one. Your prayer life as a Bible-believing, God-fearing Christian man or woman, the majority of it's going to be one-on-one -on -one with the Lord. Okay? Why? Because you're, it's all about having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. So many people attack that. True biblical salvation, and they attack having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Um, in the Bible, time and time again, you're to pray to God. You're to pray to God. It's called conversation with God. It's having a personal relationship with God. It's all throughout the New Testament telling us how we are supposed to communicate with God, how God communicates with us through the Holy Spirit, through His Word, we're to stay in His Word. It's all about having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. But one of the reasons that we pray, and a lot of times it's a big reason for me, Matthew 26, 41. Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. One of the biggest times I pray is when temptation sets in, when I start getting tempted, uh, thoughts come in that's not supposed to be there. When I fall into sin, I fall on my knees and repent. Um, your first response, when, not just with sin, but your first response should always be when things are falling apart, when you're falling into temptation, the world's, you know, attacking you, things are just falling apart or things are hurting, your first response should always be to take it to the Lord in prayer. To always pray. Okay? One of the other big things we do in prayer is pray for one another. Ephesians 1.6, this is Apostle Paul. Cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. 2 Timothy 1.3 
I thank God whom I serve from my forefathers with pure conscience that without ceasing I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day. So, throwing out just a couple things. We're going to get more into prayer later. But you, one of the big reasons we pray is because of temptation. Lord, save us from this temptation. Lord, help me to overcome sin. And what does God point you to? Perfect written word. But I'm jumping the gun a little bit. But we also pray for one another. So I wanted to throw that in real quick because the main part for verse 23 in Matthew 14 <clears throat> is that Jesus was alone and he was praying. And to encourage the brothers and sisters in Christ out there that a maturity of your prayer life is supposed to be one-on-one -on -one with the Lord. It's supposed to be that way. You ask other people to pray for you, but uh, people kind of get on to me a little bit because I just, I'm not into the group prayer thing, you know. It's all come together, hold hands, and just pray, you know, pray, 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 pray. It's like a majority of your life is supposed to be one-on-one -on -one with the Lord. I will pray with my wife when the Lord blesses me with the wife, and I will pray with my children if the Lord blesses me with children. But most of my prayer life is going to be one-on-one -on -one with the Lord. So I want to encourage you that if you feel like it just... It should feel that way. The loneliness is one of the biggest things that drags us down. Bible-believing Christians, men and women drown down. You can attest to this. It is loneliness. But realize that if you have a very active prayer life, you won't feel that lonely all the time. So, verse 24, Matthew 14. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossing with waves, for the wind was contrary. I find that very interesting. So I decided to do an analogy, like a parable, if you would say, a picture in your head. So if you can picture this, you are in the boat, and the boat, the boat is the Word of God. Truth. You're setting in the Word of God. You're setting in truth. You're saved. God saved you. You're doing your best to live a godly life and do what's right according to the Word of God. The water, the waves... That's the lost world. And notice the wind. What's usually contrary to us? False converts. So if you liken the waves to the lost world and the wind to false converts, as we go through this study, you'll understand what's going on here. Remember, the wind's going against them, con contrary. The wind was contrary. It's going against them. When you stand for absolute truth, you live according to the King James Bible, the lost world's going to fight you. But you know who's going to fight you the most, especially in these last days? False converts. Satan worshipers. They think they're worshiping Jesus Christ, but they're really worshiping an antichrist. False converts. So remember those three things. You, Bible-believing Christian, in the boat, God's Word, and you have the waves, the lost world, and the wind that's contrary is false converts. So... Remember this. Now, Ephesians 4.14, if you want to turn there real quick. I threw this in there because, um, remember it says, tossed with waves. And I got to thinking, and the Lord's like, check this verse out. So, Ephesians 4.14, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. Remember, the wind is false converts. By the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive, but speaking the truth in love, may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. The part there where it says, whereby they lie in wait to deceive, I always tell people that the deception doesn't come right away. A lot of the good ones... They will hide and they'll wait away a while. They'll come out, I'm a King James Bible believer, and they'll start parroting, not that they're learning anything new, but they'll parrot things that they've been taught from the King James Bible, and everything seems good, and a year might go by, two years might go by, they get their hooks in you, and then the deception starts coming, and they'll slowly start bringing in deception. So when it says whereby they lie and wait to deceive, they'll, they're very, the really good people that deceive, are, are very patient. They'll slowly bring in heresies over time. But remember, the main part there, 
tossed to and fro, carried and carried away with every wind of doctrine. We're rowing against the wind. That's what's going on here. They're rowing against the wind, trying to get to the, to the other side, you know. Heaven, they're, 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 that way. They're, they're trying to head to heaven, you know. Uh, not that they're earning their salvation. I'm just talking about that's the narrow path. You're on the narrow path, and everything's against you as you're trying to go forward. The crowd, someone mentioned once that it's like you're walking in a crowd, and you feel like you're the only one going that way, and everybody's coming this way, and you're bumping into people, and you're trying to go that way, and everybody's trying to get you to go this way. Okay, contrary, the wind, false converts are trying to get you to turn around and go the opposite direction. So, back to Matthew 14, verse 25. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them, walking on the sea. Okay. He's walking on the sea. And sometimes I look at this, and as we get to the story, uh, a lot of times, um, people will try to take analogies, and it could mean this, it might just me, just in my own heart, in my own mind. It reminds me of uh, 2 Peter 2, 5, And spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. Uh, as we get along in the story, Peter gets out on the water, and this world gets worse and worse and worse. And how many of us have seen it? how vexing and wicked this wor world is getting, and it's trying to swallow us up. Peter starts to sink, it's, and I'm getting ahead of myself. But it starts to swallow us up, and it gets to the point where it gets so bad, I mean, Christians being killed already overseas, they're trying to outlaw the Bible, sodomy is out of control, sexual perversion, and there's so many false Jesuses out there, so many antichrists, so many false gods, it's like Sodom and Egypt. So we're getting swallowed up, we're sinking, and God's like, uh, okay, it's time takes us out of here, pulls us up out of the water, takes us out of here. So I thought maybe that'd have some application, maybe not. Just, you know, you can let me know what you think. I just thought that was interesting. Okay. But remember, verse 25, In the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them walking on the sea. Verse 26, And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit, and they cried out for fear. I mean, I mean, think about it. You're sitting there in the boat. You're, you've been rowing. Notice it says fourth watch of the night. Uh, they've taken turns. Okay, it's your turn to start rowing. It's your turn to start rowing because they're. I mean, the wind is so contrary to them. They're having to do shifts. Okay, it's your turn to row. It's your turn to row. And they see this figure of a person walking across the water. I mean, it would at first it would kind of be kind of eerie to me too. If I'd never heard this story, read the Bible, and something like that happened to me, it'd be kind of eerie to me too. But I wanted to throw out there, if you turn to Luke 24, 39, remember they said that um, it is a spirit. Okay? I've had people get on to me because I say Holy Ghost, and then I quote scripture after scripture after scripture in the King James Bible where it says Holy Ghost. It's Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit. Okay? So, they're interchangeable, so it's like they're saying they're seeing a ghost. Mm -hmm. Luke 24, 39. This is Jesus. He appears to him after his death, burial, and resurrection. He's ascended to his Father. He comes back, and I think it's Thomas that says, I won't believe unless I touch the... I'm pointing down here, I don't know if it's on camera. His side, touch the wound in his side. So he appears to him in a locked room and says, you know, he starts talking to him. And they doubt it's him. Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see. For a spirit hath not flesh and bones as you see me. I had to throw that in there for, for the brothers and sisters in Christ. They try to say the Holy Spirit's a person, the Holy Spirit's a person. They just called Jesus a liar. Okay? For a spirit hath not flesh and bones. A person has flesh and bones. Okay. So, so they see Jesus walking on the water. Back to Matthew chapter 14. Always keep your hands there because we're going through the story. Verse 27. Now, they're all scared. They're all afraid. 
So what does Jesus do? Does Jesus laugh at him? Does Jesus go, ooh, try to scare him even more? What's Jesus' response? But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. A lot of these false religions, um, they try to hoard and rule over the lady, lady with fear. The, the false god that they worship, Satan, keeps people down with fear. I mean, most of them are cults. They're just flat out occults. I was watching the videos Brother Brian did at King James Video Ministries on the Mennonites and the Amish. Um, you look at the Catholic Church. You look at Mormonism. And you look at all these cults. They try to keep the people down with fear. Okay? Jesus isn't like that. Okay? He doesn't want us to live in fear. That's why he said, be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. So that's encouragement to you, brothers and sisters. He doesn't want you to be afraid. There's times I get scared, uh, whether I made a mistake or financial difficulties, and I sit there and I start talking with the Lord, and the next thing you know, that fear is gone. I start reading the Word, I start singing some hymns, that fear is gone. Why? Because God doesn't want us to live in fear. Now, in the past, I've said this, and I'll always iterate it, you should fear the chastening of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear comes in when it comes to sin, when it comes to flesh, when it comes to disobeying His perfect written word and not doing what you're supposed to be doing. You know, like a child would, he does something wrong, and he sits there wondering, is Dad going to catch me? Uh, and then when you do get caught, your mom, I remember the story I was told, back in the day when the father was working, the mother was a keeper at home, the, the son did something wrong, the wife would tell the son to go sit on his bed until his father got home. And he would sit on that bed, and... He'd be like, oh my gosh, what's going to happen? You know, how much punishment am I going to get in? How mad is he going to be with me? And he'd have that fear until dad came in and sat down and talked with him. And oftentimes it was a talk. Sometimes it meant chastening. There's times where God the Father is going to talk to you through his Holy Spirit, through his written word. And he's going to warn you and say, hey, you're not doing this, or you're supposed to be doing that. He's going to talk with you. But if it gets to the point where he has to chasten you, that fear is supposed to be there. But the fear we're talking about here, as you see them looking at Jesus on the water, is the fear of the world. God doesn't want you to be afraid. That's why he said, be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. Okay? John 14, 27. This is another great, the best example of Jesus not wanting you to be afraid. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. And this is talking about the Holy Spirit being in you. Peace I leave with you. God gave us the Holy Spirit so we wouldn't have to be afraid all the time. That we'd know what true peace is. Be comforted by that, brothers and sisters in Christ. We have the Holy Spirit. God doesn't want us to be afraid all the time. When you're afraid... And I, I keep, this whole study, I keep, everything ties in with everything. When you're afraid, prayer. Talk to the Lord. When you're afraid, start reading the written word of God. Play a Bible study from a, a King James Bible-believing, God-fearing man that does Bible studies online. And make sure he's a King James Bible believer. There's a lot of fakes and frauds that we'll be talking about out there. Um, sing some old uh, worship hymns that bring glory to God, not to yourself, but glory to God. And because you're glorifying God, the Holy Spirit is testifying to it, and He brings peace in your heart. Okay? God has given us the Holy Spirit. He hasn't given us the spirit of fear. I should have used that verse. Um, I'll probably put it in at the bottom, or if one of you guys want to throw it in for me. But there's a verse in there talking about how God hasn't given us the spirit of fear. He gave us the Holy Spirit. Back to Matthew chapter 14, verse 28. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, remember these uh, four words, if it be thou, remember those four words, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. 
And I threw that in there because how many of us, brothers and sisters in Christ, have come across the if it be thou people? I, when I did this study, I started thinking, I was like, uh, we used to say, uh, yea, hath God said. You've come across those people that say, yea, hath God said, yea, hath God said, have God said, um, the whole old lie by Satan trying to uh, get us away from the word of God, take our eyes off Jesus. We'll get to that in a little bit. But how many people have come by the if it be thou crowd? All right. First Thessalonians 2.13 For this cause thank we God for this cause also thank we God without ceasing. For when you received the word of God which you heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God which effectually worketh in you that also believe. Now you have the Yea hath God said crowd because they want to live how they want to live. Uh, give me a second, because they live how they want to live, but if it be God's perfect written word, then there should be some evidence and proof. Uh, they always want proof, proof. The atheist, if it, uh, if it be, the sun's kind of reflecting on this, making it harder to read it. The if it be people, uh, the atheist, if God be real, if it be that God is real, prove it. If this is God's perfect written word, prove it. I can go through, and I'm going to go through a little bit of it, but the number one reason I know this is God's perfect written word is the Holy Spirit in me attests to this. This book shows me my sins, helped me clean up my life. It's perfect. I open this book, it tells me what's going on in my life, it tells me what's going on in the world. This book is God's perfect written word. There's plenty of evidence out there but my life can attest to it. I came to the King James Bible. I found the true gospel. My life changed. I now have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ that I didn't have as a fake Christian leading people astray. Okay. I'm going to do a book study or show another book tour, but throw in a quick thing here. Guess what I found? Brothers and sisters, the New Testament in Greek. And it's written by two men. Can you guys guess what two men it is? Right. If you guessed Westcott and Hort, you were correct. I found an old, old book. You can't even read any of it. Like I said, I'll do a book tour because it's all Greek. Only the first page is English trying to like do an intro. But the whole thing is Greek. This is probably before, I'm pretty sure it is, before the Nestle's Alon. This became in, grouped in with the Nestle's Alon when they started adding their own Hebrew. So, Alexandria, Egypt. Texas Receptus. This comes from Antioch, Syria, where Christians were first called Christian. Two separate parts of the world. Okay. How do I know? That the King James Bible is definitely different from all the other Bible perversions. Even if you don't get to the point of it's God's perfect written word, because it is, and I believe that. But even if you're just trying to talk to him and say, hey, the facts are the facts. The King James Bible doesn't even come from the same part of the world as all the other Bible perversions. They come from Alexandria, Egypt. The King James Bible comes from Al um, Antioch, Syria, where Christians were first called Christians. Two different parts of the earth, world. They're not the same Bibles. All the Bible perversions are, they come from the same place. The NIV, NASV, all of them on and on and on. They come from the same spot. But you have the people that are the if it be crowd. If God be real. Uh, I brought this out here too. I found a book that has the Book of Mormon, Doctrines and Covenants, Pearl of Great Price, the stuff they don't want to tell you. They lie to people and just use the King James Bible. They don't believe in the King James Bible. They're liars and deceivers. But they have their own God. They pull you away from the real God. If the, if the God of the King James Bible be real, such and such, such and such, such and such. There's so doubt. Remember the wind being contrary. So you have Peter doubting. Okay. Now... I forgot to say this. The boat, I want the boat to represent two things. God's Word, because we're going to use uh, examples of people straying from God's Word. And the boat is also, we're going to say, is a comfort zone. Different scenario where it's your comfort zone, okay? You make your home a godly home, 
and it's your safe place. You can make it where it's, you can abstain from all appearance of evil here. I don't know how many people out there have the same feeling I do. I, God's cleaned up my life. I love my home. But anytime I go to travel, to visit people and everything, the moment I step foot into my house, I'm so glad to be home. This is my comfort zone. This is where God has given me a safe place to live. Okay. And your home should be a safe place to live, free from uh, the appearance of evil and temptations. So remember those two things, because I forgot to mention that about the boat, your comfort zone. So, the if it be people, be careful. Okay, You're going to come across a lot of those if it be people. Now, verse 29 in Matthew 14, let's go back to Matthew 14. And he said, come. This is after Peter asked, if it be thou, if it be, let's see, if it be thou, bid me to come on. So Jesus is saying, and he said, that's Jesus, come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on water to go to Jesus. Now, courageous man, foolish man. Was it very courageous for, for uh, Peter to want to step out on the boat, uh, out of the boat and onto the water? Now we're kind of switching over to the other scenario. It's not that he's trying to leave the Word of God. We're going to the scenario where he's got the boat that's his comfort zone. That's your comfort zone. And you say, a lot of us are like, Lord, we've studied your Bible for years. We've prayed. Um, we sing hymns. We talk with uh, brothers and sisters on Christ. But you know what? It's time that I step out and do more for you, Lord. I'm supposed to be part of the ministry. We're all part of the ministry, which is God's ministry. Period. I know a lot of people don't like to hear that. I've had people attack me because of that. We are all part of God's ministry. We are all called to be part of the ministry of reconciliation, preaching the gospel. Some people are better at it than others. I am still struggling so hard to have the courage to verbally talk to people. I have the fear of screwing up and saying the wrong thing. And I just, I just, God's working me on that. But I still, when I first started, I didn't say, I ain't doing it because I'm not good at it. I started laying gospel tracts places. Anytime I went in town to do something, I'd lay gospel tracts. And after about a year of doing that all the time, I started walking on the beach and I'd keep some in my back pocket and I started handing some of those out. Next thing I know, I'm talking to people a little bit. God will help you get up to that point where you can actually talk to people about Jesus Christ, the gospel. We're also called to be, uh, we'll talk about this later, ambassadors for Jesus Christ. So we get to a point in our walk with the Lord where we're saying, Lord, we want to do more for you. I want to do more for you. Bid me to step out of the boat. Lord, I want to do more for you. And in order to do more, preaching the gospel, being the ambassador for Christ, we'll find out later. It means, a lot of times it means stepping out of that comfort zone. It means putting yourself out there. So Peter says, let me come out onto the water. Is that courageous for Peter to want to do that, Lord? I mean, it's foolish for him to doubt. Jesus just said it was him. But does it take courage to step out on the water? The waves are going crazy. The lost world is going crazy today. It's just evil and wicked and vile. Uh, the wind is contrary. The false converts of the world are just sitting there waiting to pounce on you and just attack you. Attack everything you believe in, everything you stand for. The King James Bible. It takes a lot of courage to do that, brothers and sisters in Christ. And those that have done it, I want to encourage you that it's a good thing. You are courageous when you do that. God help me to have some courage. But as we're going to get here, how many of you, when you first got saved, tried to jump the gun too early? Tried to say, I'm just so... I love you, Lord. I'm so passionate. I'm going to jump out there, hit the ground running 90 miles an hour. Like, uh, you're, you're a baby Christian, but you're going to jump out there like you're a mature Christian running 90 miles an hour. And the first thing you do is two steps and bam, flat on your face. How many people have done that? I have. I so vehemently wanted to defend the King James Bible. I made a mess of the Bible because I didn't know it as well as I should have before I started going out there uh, trying to defend it and fight people. Um, I defend, you can def I'm not saying you can't defend things, but I'm talking about, you know, uh, I was making a mess of the Bible. Uh, I wasn't quoting stuff properly. I wasn't, I didn't know, you know, I should have copied and pasted and put verses out there. Um, I was fighting with people when I didn't have the maturity 
to really stand against what they're attacking me with because I couldn't answer most of their attacks. So there's a time period when you've spent time studying, growing, and maturing as a Christian. God's cleaning up your life, and you're going to get to a point where you're like, you know what, Lord, I want to do more. I want to defend you more, uh, your word more. I want to defend the major doctrines more, the true gospel. I want to have more courage in witnessing. Um, and you're going to want to step out there. But when you do it as a baby Christian, and you're supposed to be working on milk, and you try to skip milk for meat, a uh, good study that was done on that, milk versus meat, um, you're going to fall flat on your face. So let's see what happened to Peter after he got out on the water. He's got his eyes on Jesus. He starts walking towards Jesus. What happens? Verse 30. But when he saw the wind bolstering, false converts, all oh, Bible version issue isn't that big of a deal. Come on. The pre-time of Jacob's trouble, that's not a salvation issue. Even though that if you believe in post-trib or mid-trib, you're worshiping a different God than the God of pre-time of Jacob's trouble. But no, no, it's not that big of a deal. Um, eternal security versus you can lose your salvation in this church age, um, what we call the church age, this dispensation, um, you know, that's it's not a big deal. Dispensational teaching, not a big deal, you know. Uh, the uh, the gospel, there for a while they were making out that the gospel wasn't that big deal. As long as it has Jesus in it, the belief in Jesus, I mean, that's all that really matters, right? The Bible teaches that that's part of the plan of salvation. But you can't believe with Jesus Christ in your heart if you skip repentance. Our repentance study that we're doing together, um, so far, not once has it meant cleaning up your life. It's something that happens in your heart every time. Every time so far, it happens in your heart. It's not a physical act. Okay. And they throw out that. They, now they're, they're so desperate, they're throwing out prayer. Prayer's a work. It's just a belief. You believe in your head and you're saved. Well, I do believe they believe in their head. I'm not saying they're false on that. But they don't believe in your heart. And they're going to stand before God at the great white throne, ju great white throne to be judged, saying, I never knew you. Because that belief is only in their head. It never makes it down to their heart. You skip repentance, that belief will never, ever make it down to your heart. Ever. You confess both in prayer to prove to God that you're not ashamed of your repentance and your belief. That heartfelt, what's going on in the heart, you're not ashamed of it. And then you call upon the name of the Lord to save you. Prove, telling the Lord, I can't save myself. I can't earn salvation. It's, it's, your grace is a gift. I can't earn it. I can't save myself. So you got the wind bolstering, okay? He sees all these false converts. You and me, brothers and sisters in Christ, we see all these false converts attacking the King James Bible, even professing to be King James Bible believers. They're attacking the King James Bible. They're attacking the Godhead. They're attacking true biblical salvation. Um, Pre-time of Jacob's trouble. Uh, trying to throw out all the main doctrines. Uh, eternal security. Dispensational teaching. And... They're just attacking it, and you look around, and sometimes we get depressed, sometimes we get vexed, sometimes we start to lose sight of Jesus Christ, because we get suckered into arguments with them. Mm -hmm. He was afraid. Verse 30, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he, said, he started getting mad at the world, and who are you? What was his first response when he started to sink? He cried, saying, Lord... Save me! I know that's hard for those easy believism nut cases that are on their way to hell. Lord, save me! I don't know how why it's so difficult for them. Well, that's you, you ask God to save you; it's not a gift. They're so desperate to feed their flesh and live life the way they want to live. They take out repentance. They take out asking the Lord to save you. What did Paul just do right here? He's beginning to sink. He's afraid. He begins to sink. Does he get mad? Does he start paddling really quick? Starts paddling. Let's see if I can save myself and start paddling back to the boat. Is that what he's doing? No. Lord, save me. Brothers and sisters in Christ, you take a step out of that boat, out of your comfort zone. 
bad things are going to happen every once in a while. You're going to get up to your neck in water and you cannot always fix everything. You cannot solve the problem. You know who can? Jesus Christ. Your response needs to be when things start getting difficult, you start getting to your waist in water, you start getting it up to your neck. Sometimes I've been up to my neck in water and you keep trying to fix it yourself and you keep trying to handle it yourself and, and do go it alone. No, you need to be calling out to the Lord saying, Lord, save me. Lord, help me with this. Lord, I need you. Okay. Do not be a fool and not do that. Peter here was a fool for taking his eyes off Jesus and start looking at the world. Everything that was going on around him. He was a fool. But you know where he wasn't a fool? He was courageous twice. Wanting to step out on the water. And he said, Lord, save me. He didn't try to be a tough guy. He didn't try to keep it quiet because he cared about what the world thought of him. He didn't care. He started sinking. Lord, save me. Notice it's a capital L, Lord. Okay. Peter knew that Jesus is God, the Father. Now, we talked about this situation, and as we go through here, we're going to use those two scenarios about the boat. The boat's the Word of God, and when you try to step out and get away from the Word of God, what's going to happen? You're going to start sinking. God is not going to let you drown. He's going to pick you back up and find a way to get you back in that boat, as we find out later. That's one of the scenarios we're going to be talking when it comes to the world trying to take your eyes off Jesus. Our eyes should always be on Jesus Christ. And we'll talk about the five ways to keep your eyes on Jesus Christ. But the other scenario also is what we're talking about is when you want to do more for the Lord, saying, Lord, I'm ready. I want to do more. The boat's my comfort zone. I'm going to step out onto the water. I'm going to go out into the world and preach the gospel. I'm going to start standing against the false, you know, false converts that go against the Bible. I'm going to start living for you. And we're going to get to all the things that try to pull your eyes off the Lord to get you to go back into the world. So... The first thing we're going to talk about that tries to pull you eyes off Jesus Christ to get you to look at the waves, to get you to look at the wind, to start listening to false converts, to start doubting. But one of the things that does it is the cares of this world. Okay. Cares of this world. Do you care about what the world thinks? Romans 12, 12, or Romans 12, 2. I'm sorry, if you can turn to Romans 12, 2. We're going to talk about things that the cares of the world are going to try to draw you away from keeping your eyes on Jesus. They're going to try to get you out of the boat. Okay. Romans 12, 2, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Okay, Conformity. It's going to try to get you out of that boat when it comes to the Word of God. And when you try to step out and say, Lord, I want to do more for you, and you step out of that boat in the second scenario, saying, Lord, ask me to do this. Lord, I want to do more for you, but I can't unless it's your will. And the Lord says, yes, do it, and you step out. Conformity. Okay? Conformity is going to try to get you away from the Word of God, and conformity is going to try to drown you. Bottom line is still going to try to get you away from the Word of God, but conformity is going to try to drown you. It's going to try to get your eyes off Jesus so you get drowned in this world, and the next thing you know, you're back to doing conforming to the world when you're not supposed to. When we get saved, we became a new, we're a new creature in Christ Jesus. Okay? We're not to conform to the world anymore. We're, not, we're in the world, but we're not of the world. Okay? We're not to conform to the world, the styles, the fashions, what's popular in the world. Uh, we're not supposed to try to be accepted by the lost world. Okay. That's a big thing. A lot of these fakes and frauds, um, it's all about them pleasing people because they want the lost world, because they lie to people and tell them they're saved when they're not, they want the lost world to accept them. You have a lot of quote-unquote leaders in Christianity that... Even in people who are lost, they want nothing to do with Jesus Christ, will look at that guy and say, yeah, he's a pretty cool guy. He's okay. 
That goes to the next part we're doing, okay? Actually, James 4, 4, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that friendship of the world is enemy with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Now, I kind of get in a little trouble because I say you really shouldn't be a friend to the lost world. You can be friendly, you can help each other out, um, but you should always be trying to preach the gospel to them. But on a whole, the lost world, because people say, I can't have a friend that's lost. On a whole, the lost world should want nothing to do with you. I'm, I'm, I know this is tough for some people, but those of you who are hardcore as far as you've gotten past the milk, you're on the meat, every once in a while you go back to the milk to refresh you, uh, to re, you know, remind you of what the milk is, but you're on the meat, you're hardcore, fervent for the Word of God, you've changed your life hardcore, or God's changed your life, cleaned up your life, you're so separated from the lost world that the lost world looks at you and you're like, you cuss a lot, I don't want to be around you. You, you're immodestly dressed, I don't want to be around you. I'm not dressing that way and I don't want that in my presence. You're cussing, I don't want that in my presence. When you have the power and control to say, I don't want that in my presence, it's not in your presence. You have to go to the grocery store to get food. You get in there, you focus on what you're doing, and you get out because of all the wicked things around you. I understand you got to do that. But you don't purposely go to places anymore, like out to eat. I hardly go out to eat anymore. Um, I go to the beach sometimes, and I start to see immodestly dressed um, women. And there's men there, too. If you're a woman, uh, there's men there that are immodestly dressed. I see it. I, I have my cue cards and everything. I'm looking. I look at that. I'm like, I'm out of here. I don't want that in my presence. The lost world is going to look at you and go, stay away from that person. You don't want anything to do with that person. He's a Christian. He's a Bible-believing Christian. That woman, she's a Bible-believing Christian. They're not going to really want anything to do with you. And the people that are lost that will, that will, it's not that they want a lot like, I love you and I'm proud of you. No, it's more like tolerance, that they try to teach the world tolerance. And they're trying these false, uh, the wind bolstering, these fake Christians trying to teach us that we're supposed to be tolerant. Okay? I have family members that sometimes it feels like they're just tolerating me. Um, you probably have family members that the only reason they talk to you is because you're family. And uh, because they tolerate you. A lot of you out there probably have a lot harder than, I was talking to some people, they have a lot harder than I do. Brother Ryan, uh, his situation with his dad and his brother, he's got a lot harder than I do um, when it comes to family members. But on a whole, brothers and sisters in Christ, the lost world should look at you and be like, uh, I don't want anything to do with that person. They're no fun. They don't want to go to movies. They don't watch movies, they don't watch TV shows, they don't play video games, they don't go to the bars, they don't go to dance clubs, they won't go to restaurants that have bars in them, and it just, it's like there's just no fun anymore, I don't want anything to do with them. That's one of the reactions. That has to do with being a friend to the world. And if they look at you and go, oh, it's, you're a Bible-believing Christian? He still goes to movies, video games, he tells some good jokes, you know, he doesn't mind going to restaurants with bars in them. He doesn't mind people drinking around him or swearing around him. He's, he's a pretty cool guy. I don't want anything to do with Jesus Christ, but that person there claims to be a Bible-believing Christian, they're a great guy, he's a good friend. It shouldn't be that way. It should not be that way. Okay. Those two kind of go hand in hand. I have a neighbor where I'm a, I consider myself a friend. Um, but when he wants to do sin, uh, he invites me over for New Year's, sometimes for Christmas when I'm here by myself. And he likes to drink. They have food, they drink, they listen to music that I'm not, that I don't want to listen to. And I tell him no. Why? Because I'm not a friend of the world. I tell him no, I don't want that. He, he doesn't cuss. But if he cussed, I'd be like, I don't want to be around you when you're cussing. Sorry, I don't want cussing in my presence. It's not, oh, that's nice, and you just try to find a way to sneak out. No, you let them know. I don't want cussing in my presence. Person's using the Lord's name in vain every three words. You don't sit there and go, uh -huh, okay, yeah, uh -huh, uh -huh, and, be, and try to look for an escape to get out. No, you say, I don't want, I don't want that in my, I, I believe in Jesus Christ. He is my Savior. He's my Father. He's my Lord. He's my King. I don't like it when you talk to Him like that. And if the person doesn't want to stop doing that in front of you, you don't hang out with them. 
That's what it means by not being a friend of the world. And if you're truly standing for God's word and you're standing against sin, the lost world's not going to want anything to do with you, hardly. They'll tolerate you, but they won't want to be your friend. Mm -hmm. 1 John 2.15, cares of this world, things that will get, they try to get you to take your eyes off the Lord. So if anything, what I just said there is they try to get you to be tolerant of the world. We all have to get along. Um, try getting you to conform to the world. And if you start falling back into the trap of conforming, if they can get you to fall back into the trap of conforming to the world or being a friend of the world, they can take your eyes off Jesus. And what happens when you step out on the water, the scenario about wanting to do more for the Lord, you step out on the water, they can get you to take your eyes off Jesus. What happens? You start to sink. 1 John 2.15 Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. I've talked to some brothers and sisters in Christ, and they're really, really struggling. I mean really struggling when it comes to not loving the world. They have things in their life that's sinful and wicked, and the world says these things are great, and that you should love these things, and yet they need to give them up. And they're struggling with that. Uh, love not the world goes back to the other two uh, being not being conformed to this world. Okay, the world today, the average woman today and girl and child, uh, they dress immodestly, and that's normal. They love that. That's just the world loves that, and it's normal. It's not immodest, and women get mad when guys look at them in a bad way when they're dressed that way. And it's like, that's because they believe it's normal. That's what the world loves. You're not to love the world. You, the chances, I think I came across one woman every once in a while. It's very rare to come across a woman in town that's wearing a modest dress with long hair. It's, it's almost extinction. There's a lot of Bible-believing Christian women out there that want to dress that way. It's kind of expensive. But it comes back to what I was talking about, the comfort zone, the boat stepping out of your comfort zone saying, Lord, I want to be an ambassador for you. I want to be more of an ambassador. i got to dress properly. Lord, my, my vocabulary has to change hardcore. Um, you know, what I stand for, what do I allow in front of me? Even it comes down to food, eating healthy and everything, being an ambassador for Jesus Christ. Your body is a temple for the Holy Ghost. You're to take care of your body physically. There's no excuse as a Bible-believing Christian, to say, oh, there's nothing wrong with me eating junk food and fast food all the time. Yeah, there is. You're supposed to take care of your body, but you're not to love the Word. I loved Taco Bell. Now, after eating, I always tell that story, after eating healthy for about a year and a half now, I went back there to try to get a breakfast burrito when I was making a trip, a two-and-a-half-hour two hour trip, and my stomach hurt after eating just half of that burrito. My stomach was killing me. It was just, my stomach could not tolerate that filth. You start eating right, you'll realize you can't go back to the fast food. It's just junk. It's filth. 2 Timothy 2.4, remember, when you start falling into the trap, if Satan, if the false converts, if the lost worlds can get you to start loving things in the world that you're not to love, they can get your eyes off Jesus Christ. And if they can get your eyes off Jesus Christ, what happens? You start to sink. The scenario about the boat being your comfort zone. Now the scenario about the boat being the Word of God, if they can get you to conform to the world, be a, be a friend to the world, love the world, and they get you to step out of that boat, what's going to happen? You're going to sink. Period. God's Word and the Holy Spirit in you keeps you afloat, but you're going to start sinking if you step out of that boat. So two scenarios to always think about in your heart as we're talking. 2 Timothy 2.4 No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. I threw that in there because one of the other things that when it comes to the cares of this world is financial problems. Sometimes we, most times, we make a mistake and our finances aren't doing so good. But there are times where we're not doing anything wrong it's just tough times. And there's brothers and sisters in Christ out there that have lost jobs. There's brothers and sisters in Christ out there that aren't made, they're just barely, barely getting by. And 
that barely getting by weighs on them and wears on them. Okay? The cares of this world. And if you let that get to you, or if you lose your job, if you don't take it to the Lord, and you try to solve it yourself, and you just get frustrated, it can take your eyes off Jesus. Physically, two things. I always tell people two things, because I want to be nice. <laughs> I try to be nice. Your flesh can be falling apart because of two things. The number one thing, the Bible says, if you live by the flesh, ye shall die. I did things in my past that are catching up to me as I get older. My eyes going bad. Well, I used to spend like three to four hours a day, and the weekends I'd spend six hours a day watching movies, TV shows, video games, really close to the screen, but it doesn't matter, just watching it mm -hmm. on the computer. And after all these years, I got God saved me. I fought Him for two years. I got rid of all that junk, but it's catching up to me. Okay, my eyes aren't doing so good because I was into all that. Uh, there's people that used to drink when they were lost. And they, God saved them, got them cleaned up from that, and years down the road they start having physical problems because they live by the flesh. That goes for both saved and lost. It goes across the board, period, till the day you die. We are in a body of corruptible flesh. Um, I could keep going on, smoking, whatever. That's the one reason. The other reason, and I know this is a hard concept for some people, it's starting to dawn on me because I, I'm getting up there, I'm almost 40, middle-aged. Time. Time is another reason why your body's falling apart. We live in a corruptible body of flesh. As you get older, things are going to start falling apart. You're not going to be able to be as strong as you used to be, have as much energy as you used to have. Um, you end up sleeping more than you normally did. Um, all kinds of stuff. But the cares of this world when it comes to the flesh, finances, um, emotional struggles, you know, having to deal with the world. Uh, all these cares of the world, if you don't take it to God in prayer, and we're going to get to the five things, but there's things you do to keep your eyes on Jesus. And if you don't do those things or you lack in any of those things, these cares of the world can take your eyes off Jesus to get you to look at the water. Uh, the wind bolsters you to get you to take your eyes off Jesus and look at the water, to look at the world. Okay. So, so we talked about the body when we talked about you live by the flesh, you shall die. We're going to transition to the next thing that will try to take your eyes off Jesus. The old man. Lately in some of my talks, and I've talked with some people online, uh, the old man, um, your flesh, is so desperate to resurrect the old man. You want to know why? Because the old man fed the flesh. The flesh got so much food from the old man. The new man, the new creature in Christ Jesus, feeds the spirit. The flesh doesn't like that. So what's the flesh do? He's always, always trying to resurrect the old man. And if he can get you in some areas to resurrect the old man, then he can get you to take your eyes off Jesus. And put it, and it's on the flesh. It's on the world. Okay? So, Ephesians 4.22 22, that ye put off concerning the former conversation of the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. Okay. Uh, I still fight to this day. Um, I've been saved, God saved me, uh, four and a half years ago. And I struggled with sin hardcore for two and a half years before He got me kind of where I am now where I'm still struggling with sin. But the sanctification is more based off of um, the Word of God. But I don't know if people can understand what I'm saying. It's, it's more, if I don't stay in this, God won't be, I won't see the little things that are still in my life. All the big, obvious, in-your-face things, God's helped me get out of my life through His written word, the Holy Spirit and His written word. And right now, I have to stay in His word hardcore in prayer so I can still see some of the things. And I've already testified some of my testimonies of things I've found in my house after... A year and a half to two years of God, I felt like God, really, you really cleaned up my life. There's still things going on in my life that God is still cleaning up. I'm not perfect. 
But the old man, he wants you to get back to my point, is that when we say things a certain way, like there's times where I'll hear a joke that's not a good joke, and my flesh, my first response is I do a little laugh, and I stop and I go, Lord, I'm sorry. That was the old man. He loved to laugh at those things. That was, uh, that was a perverted joke, or it's a sexual joke, or it's putting someone down, or it's making fun of Christians. Whatever it is, I shouldn't have laughed at that, Lord. Please forgive me. That's feeding the Spirit. But someone who gets you, with your flesh tries to get you to get resurrect the old man where you start feeding the flesh. You keep listening to jokes like that. It's okay. Go back to hanging out around people, watching comedians, watching movies that have those jokes that cussing, cussing's not a big deal around you. I'll be honest with you. I didn't realize before I got saved how much they were using God's name in vain in movies, TV shows, uh, people around me. I was a professing Christian most of my life, and none of that seemed to bother me. It, it didn't. After our, God saved me through the true gospel found in the King James Bible, and started making changes in my life, and I went from the old man feeding the flesh to the new man feeding the spirit, I started noticing it all around me. And it, it vexed me. It bothered me where it didn't before. So the conversation of the old, don't let... It comes down to what I said. You have neighbors or you have friends that are lost that love to cuss. I don't believe a Christian, a Bible-believing, God-fearing, born-again man or woman is going to have a mouth like a sailor. They might still be struggling with it. They might slip up here and there, but they're not going to have a mouth like a sailor. But if you have lost friends, family, uh, neighbors that have a mouth like a sailor, as they used to say, then... You say, I'm sorry, I'm not going to be around you. Not until you clean that up. And I'm not, you're not telling them to clean it up to be saved, but I'm just saying, you know what I'm saying? If you want to be around me, you can't be like that. I don't want that around me. It goes back to why you're not a friend of the world, why you're not popular. You won't resurrect the old man. That's why you're not popular. Colossians 3 9. Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds. Okay? You, your flesh tries to pull you back into doing things that you did when you were lost that pleased the flesh, but after you got saved, God said you need to give that up. It's wrong. It's wicked. And you're like, I'm feeding the Spirit? Yes, sir. I'm a soldier? Yes, sir. I'm giving that up. What does your flesh try to do? He tries to get you to go back in there so you can start feeding the flesh again instead of feeding the Spirit. The deeds, the man with his deeds, the things you used to do. Okay. Romans 6.6 6, Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. You know the old man was in bondage to the flesh? Your flesh loved that. The old man, you, the flesh was in charge. You were in bondage to sin. The, the flesh wants to get you back there. And the lost world appeals to the flesh. These um, false converts, the easy believism crowd, they appeal to the flesh. Uh, people who are against absolute truth appeals to the flesh. You get to be the final authority. Uh, people who want to get you to fight, their whole ministry is about fighting people, and they get you to try to rile up your flesh and please your flesh to fight one another. Um, the easy believism, another thing is there's no changed life. The flesh loves that. That's why there's so, so many false converts today. Because Satan's like, you know what? I'm going to pose a Jesus Christ, a fake Jesus Christ, Antichrist, and I'm going to tell people they can keep their sin and be saved. People love it. That's this easy believism crowd. People love it. The old man loves it. Okay, one of the things that tries to get you to leave the boat, the Word of God, is the old man. Why? Because if you fall back into sin, and the flesh can get you to fall back into sin, and it, the lost world can get your flesh to like rile your flesh up to get it to tempt you even more to fall back into sin, false converts, it'll take your eyes off Jesus Christ. And how many of us that have fallen into sin, that um, there's times in that two and a half year struggle that 
right at the end when I was like, okay, I gave up video games, I fall back into playing one or two of them, I might watch a TV show or I got suckered into watching a movie, that all of a sudden I realized if it was it was it was miserable. It's like I was forcing myself to do it, but it was my flesh forcing me, but I still gave in. And I was miserable and I realized when I finally said, Lord, this is enough's enough. I'm sorry. I should never have gotten back into this. Please forgive me. I turn around and focus back, put my eyes back on Jesus. I stop and I go, it's been two weeks since I read the Bible. It's been a month since I read the Bible. It's been two weeks to a month since I prayed, since I sung a hymn, since I watched a Bible study. You know, I can go on and on and on. That's why. Keep, get your eyes off of Jesus. When you start feeding your flesh, and that's what your flesh wants, that's what the lost world wants, that's what these false converts want, it takes your eyes off the real Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.17 This is the one. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Behold, old things have passed away. I'm sorry, old things have passed away. Behold, all. There's the key word that those uh, faith alone people can't stand. All things have become new. That's what the lost world hates. That's why they don't want to get saved. They love their sin. They love living the way they want. Behold, all things have become new. There isn't a choice. Well, I'll give up this sin, but I, I can keep that one. Or I can give up half my sins and keep half my sins. There is no choice. You get saved. Behold, all things become new. Your attitude towards sin is going to change. You're going to hate it. God's going to say, hey, this is sin. You're not going to feel, you're not going to do, basically, someone did a, a thing for me. It was like, you're not going to do a, what do you call it? My brain freezes sometimes. A ceremony, <laughs> like a burial ceremony, like when you have to give up something and you're playing the taps and everything and I got to give up this sin and, and it's one big show and oh my gosh, I can't believe it. I got to give up the no, your attitude is, I'm going to hate sin. And when you find out there's something sin, you're probably going to have the attitude of, really, Lord, I love that. That's one of the things I love doing. That's one of the things I have in my home that I love. You mean to tell me that this is a false god? I had those plates. This is a false god? You're telling me these are satanic symbols? You're telling me I shouldn't have this? <sighs> Lord, I love you more than I love this stuff. It's gone. I'll get rid of it. It's gone. I mean, you, you understand my attitude here. I'm not, yay, it's gone. Sometimes you're going to be like, uh, it's gone. But you know what? I hate sin. I hate evil. And I love the Lord. I'm getting rid of it. I'm not going to, a funeral. I'm not going to have a funeral <laughs> for every time I have to give something up that's sin. You know? That means you're having a hard time letting it go. And you should be able to let it go sometimes. Struggle with it is the key. Struggle, struggle, struggle with the flesh. The old man gave in to the flesh. Didn't even struggle with them. The new man, new woman, they struggle with the flesh. They don't justify it. They don't just give in to it in a heartbeat. They're not run, their life is not run by the flesh. They're not in bondage to the flesh. That's why a changed life is evidence of salvation. But if the flesh can get you down get you back into sin, get you back into doing things you used to do as the old man, it can take your eyes off Jesus. And when he takes your eyes off Jesus, um, you start to sink. Now remember, the two scenarios, and I'm trying to get, keep getting back to them so it doesn't get confusing. When you say, I want to step out of the boat and do more for the Lord, the stuff we're talking about is going to hit you twice as hard. The stuff we're talking about now for the baby Christian that you're first starting out, it's been, a, you know, to me it was like almost three years before I started coming out and doing, like wanting to step out of that boat and really do hardcore for the Lord. Put, put myself out there to be attacked. Um, start preaching the gospel verbally. Um, and, and risk people just yelling at me or saying, you know, I'm a retard or whatever because I believe in a God that I can't see. Yeah. But when you, before you get to that point of saying, hey, I want to step out of the boat, you're in your boat, you're in the Word of God. So all this stuff we're talking about, what it's trying to do is get you to step out of the boat. Because it knows if it can get you to step out of the boat, you're going to sink. You're just going to sink. 
For those of us who want to step out of the boat when it comes to the scenario of the boat's our comfort zone and we want to do more for the Lord, you've got to understand when you step out of that boat, this stuff here is going to hit you twice as hard. Your flesh is going to hammer you twice as hard. The lost world is going to hammer you twice as hard. False converts, when you kept quiet and just focused on your walk with the Lord, pretty much left you alone. But the moment you start getting out there and you start defending the major doctrines, defending the true gospel, defending the real Jesus Christ of the Godhead, and, and telling the people that they're serving a pagan, satanic God of the Trinity, lowercase g God, a fake Jesus, and Antichrist, they're not going to leave you alone. They're going to start attacking you twice as hard. This stuff's going to hit you twice as hard. Be courageous. And I'm going to show you what you can do to keep this stuff from getting to you. Okay. Every once in a while it still might get to you, but to keep you, to help you keep your eyes on Jesus. So right now we're still talking about things that are trying to get your eyes off Jesus. Remember, baby Christian, they're trying to get you out of the boat. They're trying to get you away from the Word of God. A mature Christian that says, hey, I want to do more for you, Lord. I, I want to step out of the boat. Ask me, Lord, use me. Ask me to do something. I want to do something for you, Lord. When you step out, these things are going to hit you twice as hard.